Good morning, Crossbridge. I am so excited to be with you today. And if you are a guest with us, I am so happy that you've chosen to join with us. Our hope for you is that you join us in taking one step forward in your faith. It's always an honor when I get a chance to preach here at Crossbridge, and I'm excited just to dive in with you today as we try and understand more about who Jesus is and who he is to us. Because all over, people have ideas and thoughts about who Jesus is and what we should believe in as, as a church or as a religion. Everyone believes in something. But what is the truth? How do you know it's true? And what do we, as a church body, actually believe in? So we decided to do this series called I Believe, and we've been taking a look at the Apostles' Creed, breaking down some of the key phrases in it. And each week, if you've been tracking along with us, we have been reciting the Apostles' Creed together wherever we are. Some of you, after we've been reading it, have mentioned that you've never heard the Apostles' Creed before, or some of you are like, yeah, I've heard it, I've said it in a few places, I have really no idea where it's come from. Or maybe like many of us here at Crossbridge, at some point you were part of or have a background in the Catholic Church and you've recited the Apostles' Creed countless of times. And we've been looking at the Apostles' Creed, talking about what we believe in. Pastor Jimmy and Becky have kind of used this idea of a Jenga tower, this idea of putting a picture in our minds that there are some pillars of our faith that are crucial to the foundation and overall structure of what we believe in. So some quick reminders of the Apostles' Creed, and I promise we are not going to go through all of the history and details about the Apostles' Creed. If you need a refresher or a reminder or want to know those things, you can go on YouTube or Facebook and look up week one of our series. But to give you a quick reminder, the Creed was written in about the third or first, fourth century and then finally finalized to the version we have or that's most commonly used in about like the sixth or seventh century. It was not written by the apostles, but actually 150 years after them. It's called the Apostles' Creed because it's supposed to be a record or a summary or like a bullet point of what the apostles believed and taught to the early church. So I want to remind you that we are not preaching the Apostles' Creed. You're not going to be able to open to a certain book of the Bible, flip there, and read the Apostles' Creed because it's just simply not in there. A pastor named Matt Chandler from the Village Church put it this way. Think of the Apostles' Creed like the moon. The moon does not give off light, but it reflects the sun. The Apostles' Creed is reflecting the truth of God's word. So we're not preaching the Apostles' Creed. Rather, we are preaching scripture and using the creed kind of as an outline to reflect what we believe in as a church, as believers who follow Jesus. Creeds have no power, right? The Apostles' Creed has no power in itself, but the power is of God, right? It's pointing to true power. So the Apostles' Creed is pointing to the power and authority of God's word. Now, there are two historical uses for the creed. The first and primary reason was it was meant to be this uniting tool to the global church to help its spiritual formation. It was to unify believers into understanding who God is and what we as a whole believe in. This is why in the beginning of the creed, it starts with, I believe, right? I believe in the creator of heaven and earth and who Jesus Christ is and going, I believe in the Holy Spirit. It's this idea that's forming us in unity to remind us where our focus lies. But another use of the creed, which is secondary, but so also important, is that the creed was used to help correct error in the church. Throughout history, we have a tendency to drift from truth. It's not a new thing, rather it's a human thing. We see this early on in Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve, right? Most of you might know this story whether you were churched or not, but you have Adam and Eve in the garden and Eve talks to the serpent and just by a twisting of few words, she drifts from the truth. And time and time again, as you read the Bible, you see people begin to drift from truth. Even in the start of the early church, we see issues coming up where the people of God began to drift off and believe what was not true about God. They began to believe what they wanted to believe. This is not a new thing. And the Apostle Paul even warns Timothy, this young pastor, about this very topic. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 3, Paul says this, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, 
but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Paul knew that people drifted to what they wanted to hear. Timothy knew that people drifted into what they wanted to hear. And I know today people are drifting from sound teaching to what they want to hear. I've gone to, maybe you've gone to church before, or maybe you heard this already, or maybe you're thinking, oh man, this is going to be another church talking about false teachers. I say this because that, that phrase is going around a lot lately. But what I'm truly trying to remind you of is that this isn't new. It's been happening for thousands of years. It's not something we're making up or being too cautious about when we're talking about false teachers or taking it seriously when it says stay away from hearing these things. I want you to remember that we are a church focused on truth. This is something believers need to be aware of. Paul is telling Timothy, people do not always want to hear the truth. I think he's saying this because many of us know the truth is not always easy to hear, right? Paul is telling Timothy, people will not look for sound teaching of the truth because it may offend them or be hard to swallow or understand. So he says that they will search out teachers for themselves who will preach and teach and share about things that they want to hear. Now, I heard this week as I was listening to a few different sermons, and these are not official stats as it takes years for these studies to be created. But from what I've been seeing around, it's pretty accurate. There are studies being done right now on the American church post-COVID, or rather post-COVID round one. They're beginning to show what happened to church attenders over the year of the pandemic. They said if you take an average American church, so the average run-of-the-mill American church, it says that it's showing a third of its people, a third of its people are diving into the church more regularly. They're giving their whole heart into it. They're giving more. They're faithful. They're reading scripture all the time. They're finally like, okay, I'm going to focus on God more. I'm going to focus on my faith. But then you have this other third, and they have no idea what they're doing. They're not, they don't know if they want to commit. They don't know if they want to go. They're kind of just coasting, and they're like, "Ah, I don't really know if I'm going to stay. So you have one third who's diving in deeper. You have one third that's like, I don't really know what I'm doing. And then you have another third that are just gone. What's interesting, though, was with the last third that are gone, they are finding that a lot of them haven't left the faith, but they are finding that a lot of them are seeking churches that fit their ideals and desires and expectations, specifically on topics like politics or sexuality and race. They found a church that fits more their ideals rather than the truth of Scripture. When asked, right, so we're not making assumptions, when these last third were asked why they're choosing the church they're going to, it's because it fits their cultural ideas and political values, and those are more important to them than if the Bible is accurately being preached. So please hear me on this, because I know some people will think I'm talking about you or trying to single you out or singling a group of people out, and I'm not doing that. And I'm not saying that leaving a church is a bad thing as a whole. That's not what I'm saying, so please do not email Pastor Jimmy that I said something incorrect. What I'm saying is, That when attending a church, any church, make sure it's because they are speaking the truths of Scripture and not just what you want to hear. This is what Paul is warning Timothy about. This isn't just a Crossbridge issue. This is something something happening across the church in America. So please don't think that I'm saying this with some motive or agenda or if you leave a church, you're obviously going for church politics. That is not what I'm saying. I'm simply pointing out how people were clearly doing this in the first century, and the same is true for us today. I just want for you to seek out all the truth of Scripture, even if that truth makes you uncomfortable. I want to seek out the whole truth of Scripture, even if it makes me uncomfortable. If you do that with us or another group of believers, that's great. Just make sure that you you and they are going after the gospel, going after scripture, not just what you want to believe or what you want to hear, right? Paul says in his letter to the young Galatian church, he says this in chapter one, verse six, I am shocked 
that you are turning away so soon from God who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news, but it is not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. Let God's curse fall on anyone, including us or even an angel from heaven, who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach to you. I say what we have said before. If anyone preaches any other good news than the one you welcomed, let that person be cursed. Obviously, I am not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. Remember, this was during the start of the churches. This is where people were coming in and ever so slightly twisting just a few words here and there when it came to the gospel, and it was pretending to be the truth, and it was fooling people away from the true gospel, right? The true good news. So Paul is clear. Do not do this. Don't try and please people and just tell them what they want to hear. Don't just try and please the surrounding culture and tell them what they want to hear. Teach people the truth. Teach them the real, full, whole entirety of the gospel. And we are living in a time where there are a lot of teachers and there are a lot of voices and a lot of different opinions. And the scary part of all of this is that we are carrying them around in our pockets all day. We can get caught up listening to the ones who speak our truth. I'll confess and admit that I'm guilty of that sometimes. This is one of the primary reasons the Apostles' Creed was even written, to protect believers from drifting and help us stay focused on the truth, pointing us constantly to Jesus. It helped the church back then, and it helps the church now. So when we read the Apostles' Creed together, we are doing two very important, powerful things. We are rejecting and pledging allegiance. So how can we do that? How can we reject and pledge allegiance, right? We're rejecting the narrative of the culture around us, and we're pledging allegiance to a holy God. So with all of that, are you finally actually ready to hear today's message, today's sermon? Because I talked a lot about that other stuff. Will you stand with me as we recite the Apostles' Creed together, wherever you are? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead, he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Becky mentioned like two weeks ago while she was preaching how basically there is so much truth packed into these statements that it would be impossible to try and go over all of it in one sermon or sermon series. And I'm sorry that today it really won't be any different. There's so much I want to walk through with you, but not enough time to go over all of it. So you may think, wait, you went over this, but you didn't go over that. Or what about this? Or I have more questions on that. And yes, I understand completely. And I'm already with you. Here's why we can't hit it all. If you don't know how we prep sermons here at Crossbridge, we try our best, I mean it, we try our best to plan months in advance, but trying to leave freedom for changes, and if the Holy Spirit is pointing us in a way, we're going to go that way. But while this sermon series was planned, I was on sabbatical, all right? I, was, I wasn't here, I was, you know, everywhere, and thank you again so much for letting me take that time, and if you ever want to talk about what I did and hear the funny stories from it, just... Give me a call or let's go out to lunch and I will tell you all the crazy things that happen. But while I was away, Pastor Jimmy and Becky worked on this series and laid out the weeks. And of course, when I get back, Pastor Jimmy explained to me the series and told me which phrase was mine. He descended into hell. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead and he ascended into heaven. Think about that just for a second. Think about what kind of phrase that is. He descended into hell and then three days later rose again from the dead and ascends into heaven. What? Think about this statement just for a second and then try and wrap your head around this. 
Just seeing the word hell leads to thousands of questions. Then trying to understand, wait, he rose again from the dead? And to top it off, now Jesus kind of floats off into heaven? What kind of phrasing is that? And I can promise you, you are going to be left with questions. As I was even learning about the Apostles' Creed and looking at the verses we're going to talk about today, I felt like, oh, I finally got an answer. And then like 10 more questions that needed answering. But we're going to have a lot of questions, especially with that first statement, he descended into hell. This statement alone is one of the most controversial, debated statements in the whole entire creed, because it was not even originally written in the 3rd or 4th century with the original writing. It was actually added more like in the 5th or 6th century. So why would we go over this then? I don't think hell is really a topic anyone wants to talk about these days. But if you remember what we talked about just in the beginning of our time together today, we talked about itching ears. And there has been a lot of talk and debates over the years around if hell is even a real thing. For some, this might be a shocker. You believe and have always believed that hell was a literal place. But many are coming to this idea that even though the Bible talks about hell, hell couldn't be an actual place. They're totally okay with heaven, right? That sounds great. That sounds cool. Heaven, yeah, that exists. But hell, uh, that, that doesn't seem like it would fit. So why leave this in there and preach through it if there are versions without it? We think it's important that this phrase is in there. Because as believers, we have to stick to the whole truth of Scripture, right? That's what we've been talking about today. We want to stick to the whole gospel, the whole truth. And we cannot deny that the Bible talks about hell as a real place. This is not mere myth. And God's Word talks about this, so we're going to talk about it. But how we talk about hell isn't always the way the Bible talks about it. When we think of hell, we think of this fire and Satan who for some reason is always with red horns and a spiky tail and has this pitchfork and he's sitting on some kind of like kingly throne in hell watching people be tortured and tormented and all the people who did the bad things on earth. We set Satan up as some kind of ruler of hell, right? When you ask a few people, oh, where's, what's Satan do? Oh, he's the king of hell. But when we look at scripture, it actually says, and we quickly realize this, that Satan is not the ruler of hell. Hell is his prison. Hell is his cage. Satan's ending point is hell. It's, where, it's his demise. So we have lots of different words for hell from Scripture. And this is because the Bible represents so many different cultures. So it's referred to as death or Hades, the grave, Sheol, Guiana, the pit, a lake of fire, which sounds kind of cool and awesome, and more. So what is the creed talking about here when it says, and descended into hell? Remember, it's pointing, right? The creed is pointing to the truth of God and the truth of Scripture. The creed is pointing to Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, we will be opening, or will you open with me to Matthew chapter 27? This is kind of our anchor point for this morning. And we're going to read a good chunk of scripture today. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to grab them. Last week, we talked about Jesus' Jesus's physical life and death. How Jesus suffered, was crucified, died, and was buried. And how Jesus was truly a human, right? He was a man who came and lived an actual life here on earth, and then he died an actual real death. But as we've been learning and discussing over these past few weeks, Jesus is more. Jesus is more than just a man, more than just a human. Jesus was and is God. This is what theologians call the hypostatic union of Christ. What a word, hypostatic union. If you thought we were just going to talk about hell, slip that phrase into any conversation today and you will seem smarter than the people around you. This phrase sums up, right? The hypostatic union sums up how Jesus is both fully God and fully man. Jesus is fully God and fully man. And last week, Pastor Jimmy walked us through how Jesus is truly man. But there's more to the story than that. When we look at the death of Jesus, it is more than just one man dying, but it's a sacrifice to a holy God. This was more than just a death. There was something supernatural and spiritual happening throughout eternity at the moment of Jesus' death. So if you remember the crucifixion scene, 
Think back to kind of the Easter and all the, the movies that play, like the Passion of the Christ or all the sermons that you've heard. Jesus was an innocent man taken away in the middle of the night, brought before Rome authority, beaten unrecognizable, forced to carry the cross, is stripped naked, hung on a cross as the people who earlier in the week were praising his name and laying palm branches at his feet are now laughing at him, hurling insults at him, waiting for him to suffocate and die. So I want to read his death scene, but I want to show you that there's much more going on here than just a man dying. So jump with me to Matthew chapter 27, verse 45. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness was all over the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, yama shabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn from in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. You cannot read this and then just tell me that this is some normal death of a criminal. As Jesus is dying in the afternoon, an eclipse happens during a full moon and there's darkness over all of the land. And in the theme of last week, this is not just a Jesus Christian moment. This is not just happening in the book of Matthew, but this is recorded by historians throughout history and in different cultures. The moment Jesus died, there was an earthquake, the temple curtain was torn in half, rocks began to split open, tombs broke open, and faithful believers who believed in God came back to life. Tell me that there is not more going on here. Something intense that when you're reading it, you're like, wait, what just happened? And then you read it again to make sure it actually said what it said. But with all of that, I want to look at verse 46, where Jesus shouts, my God my God, why have you forsaken me? Why would Jesus say this? Well, again, there are two things happening. One, Jesus is pointing back to Psalm 22. Remember the humiliation psalm from last week? It's the psalm talking about a beloved king being crushed, and then they hurl insults and take his clothes, and he shouts in the middle of the verse, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is literally what's happening to Jesus, and in this moment, he is telling the onlookers that are watching this scene, hey, this was written about hundreds of years before. It was always going to happen this way. But why would Jesus pick these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, from this psalm? Jesus, the Son of God, the one who always leaned on God and had this intense, loving relationship, is shouting at his Father in heaven, why have you forsaken me? Because Scripture tells us in this moment that Jesus takes on the sins of the world. This is not just about physical torture which on its own is already unbearable. But the Son of God is giving his body up to take our place for the penalty of sin. Like flip with me to Isaiah 53, which we know is foretelling the death of Jesus' death, and it tells us that the moment, in that moment of his death, that God would have to crush him. Isaiah 53 verse 10 says this, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Think about what is happening in this moment. The Bible has told us, right? It tells us we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of God's glorious standard. And for thousands of years, when we read the Old Testament, we see that they would have to make sacrifices and offerings to atone, right? To make up for these sins, right? Sin being anything we have done or said or thought that is outside the will, outside the ideal that God had for us. The penalty... We see this in Romans, the penalty of sinning against a holy God was death. Someone 
had to die for sin. For thousands of years, they were offering sacrifices to pay the debt of sin. And God told them to do this because it was pointing to Jesus. For thousands of years, they were offering these sacrifices to pay the debt of sin, but that was like putting a band-aid on a giant open wound. God had to have the penalty of sin. And Jesus willingly took our place to pay that penalty, which was death. Someone had to pay the cost. So Jesus took our place. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin, Jesus, who was a real man, lived a sinless life. He understood the law. He's been, he, like how we're reading Leviticus for soap in church. Jesus knew it all. He memorized it all. He would know all of the laws and all of the commandments and he never sinned but kept the law and even fulfilled the law. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us that he who knew no sin became sin. Jesus, who never sinned, took on and became sin for all of those people who were standing there mocking him that day, for all the people who would one day become the church, for all of the people throughout eternity. He took the sin of the world. He became sin. Can you imagine what that was like for Jesus? Then, as he takes on the sin of the world, the shame of the world, the Father turns His face from His own Son. That the Father had to present His Son, Jesus, as a sacrifice for sin. Jesus, in this moment, for the first time, separated from His Father and had to be crushed by Him to satisfy the wrath of God, bearing all sin, completely separated from His Father, this is hell. This is what it means that Jesus descended into hell, which is truly what hell is, is true separation from God. We, all of us, anyone listening to this message, anyone who's living now on the earth has never spent a moment truly separated from God. He has held the universe together. He held our world together. He's holding your life together. But in this moment, the man of God the Son of God, dying on the cross from our sin, separated from those He came to save, and separated from God who had to crush Him to pay our debt. This is the hell that Jesus, who was in glory, willingly stepped down and He cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He stepped out of glory and descended into separation from God, hell. But even these crying out words were not his last. When you read the account of John, one of his disciples, who had a front row seat to this whole gruesome scene, John records his last words in John chapter 19, verse 30, which says, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. In this moment, Jesus Christ destroyed the power of sin forever. This was the moment he died for the sins of the world that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. It is finished. Jesus finished the work of God. He does not have to go to hell because he's carrying the sins of the world. No, the power of sin was destroyed in this moment. This is why he cries out, it is finished, because he finished the work. He paid the debt. It is finished. Praise God. This is why it's so important that we leave this statement in the creed because it's pointing to the finished work of the cross, that your debt, my debt, our debt was paid for. And it's finished. But it doesn't stop there, does it? I'm glad you asked because this story's not even close to being done. We are just getting started. The creed goes on to say, the third day he rose again from the dead and he ascended into heaven. Before we even get into the marvelous what 
of that statement, he rose again from the dead, I want to look at that third day part. Why three days? Did God just pick a random number and say, okay, you're going to hang back for three days? Was Jesus just hanging out? Was it some cosmic game of hide and seek? Wait, where's Jesus? Did you know, and this, was a, this is something I learned, did you know that the Jewish nation had their own myths? That there was actually thought in Jewish custom that the spirit of a person's body would actually hang around the body for a couple of days? So if Jesus would have come back right away, day one, they would chalk it up to this Jewish myth of, well, you weren't really even dead. You were hanging out by the body. So he stayed dead for three days to prove he died a real death. This brings us back to he descended into hell. I told you these statements pack a lot of truth into them and take time to really understand because it's shaping our foundation. It's helping build our structure of what we believe. We know that Jesus didn't go to heaven yet. But like I said, hell is not a place where he went to. It's not in the same sense that we think of, right? Jesus didn't go to hell in the, the picture that we kind of put in our minds. There are many words for hell in our translation. It's a very broad term. Jesus went where all humans at that time went when they died. He went to a place called Sheol, or for some of us that would translate as Hades the place of the dead. It meant the grave or the place of the dead. We see this throughout the Old Testament and in the Psalms. Even from the Gospels, we read from stories from Jesus, there's a righteous side of Sheol and an unrighteous side. We see this with the story of Lazarus and the rich young ruler. This is where Jesus went in true human fashion because he was truly dead. But Jesus also had work to do. Not only does he go to the grave because he's dead, but in 1 Peter 3, in verses 18 to 19, we get a glimpse of what Jesus is doing while, during those three days. It says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. When it's talking about spirits in this verse, the spirits in prison, it's not talking about unbelieving souls. Jesus is not going to the unbelievers who have died and preaching the gospel to them. It would have been specific about those spirits like it is in other places of scripture. We want to stay consistent. Jesus went to the enemies of God, right? He went to the fallen. He went to those demonic places and beings. And Jesus went to the enemies in prison to proclaim his victory. Jesus was telling them, those spirits, the same thing he told the onlookers on the cross, that the work is finished, that death and these enemies have no hold on him. Here, in this moment, spiritually, he's now saying, I am God, and I have the victory. He proves this, right? Jesus proves this victory call by rising again. Look, when we, rec when we recited this this morning, the creed, we're saying we believe. Think about what you said. We believe that Jesus, a human, rose again from the dead. Jesus proves in this that he is more than that. He rose again from the dead. He is God. Jesus truly is the Son of God who is God. He proves this to the spirits in prison and to the world that what the centurion said as he watched him die was truly he is the son of God. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, proving once and for all he is God. This is what our faith hinges upon. If you want to destroy Christianity, if you want Christianity to fall apart, this is where it would have to crumble. This is where Christianity would have to be wrong. This is where we see Jesus proving he is who he said he is. He's not a lunatic. He's not some just good teacher. He's not a liar. He is God. There were debates throughout history that maybe this account, maybe this moment where Jesus rose again from the dead didn't happen, even though we know that Jesus revealed himself to over five hundred witnesses. But theories began to come out that, well, the reason he wasn't in the tomb was because the disciples must have took the body. 
or that even though he was beaten so severely, stabbed in the side, wrapped in grave clothes, and put behind a giant stone with a seal on it, he wasn't actually dead, but he was actually barely alive or nearly dead. And somehow this bloody mess of a human would crawl his way out of that tomb. The reason that this doesn't really make that much sense it was, is because the disciples after this, all of them give their lives for Jesus. Most of them die in a gruesome, tortured way, martyred for their faith because they were going out preaching the story of Jesus and that they have a risen, alive Savior. They go into the world preaching the gospel and telling of his resurrection. We soaked Acts as a church, and you know, come on, you know the boldness that swept over the disciples. Do you think if they would have seen a beaten, bloody body crawling its way back to them, that it would have given, given them any type of boldness and confidence to go into the whole world preaching of his greatness? It would have terrified them. They'd say, we can't do this. Look what happened to you. We're not going to go out and do that. But no, the opposite happens. They're so bold in confidence, they run to tell people and go into dangerous parts of the world to preach the gospel. Jesus rose from the dead and was alive and well. And in the end of the book of John, we see stories where Jesus reveals himself to his disciples and he shows them the scars of his crucifixion. It proves he is who he said he is. In John chapter 21, he eats breakfast with them to prove he has an actual body. Jesus is alive. And the reason our faith hinges upon this fact is because what separates us from all other religions, from all other beliefs, is the fact that all those other religions, if they had a person who claimed to be God that walked the earth, when that person died, they stayed dead. But Jesus is the living God because he's alive. He proved he was God. In Acts chapter 1, in verse 8 and 9, we see that Jesus, in his actual body, his risen human body, ascended into heaven. It says this in verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And when he said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Picture the disciples in this moment. They are watching the risen Jesus ascend into heaven. Could you even imagine what that looked like? Jesus, the living God, our Christ, our Savior, ascended into heaven and is seated on the throne and he's going to come again. The creed is pointing us to the truth of God that Jesus is God. Jesus is the Christ, he is the savior of the world, and they cannot be separated. You don't have Jesus and then you have Christ. No, it's Jesus Christ, they are one and the same. So no matter what popular belief may say or what human logic wants to wrestle with, Jesus and Christ are not separated. It's not that Jesus died and Christ arose. And No, Jesus is Christ, who is fully human, fully God, and he proves this by rising from the dead in his actual body. Jesus is God. And in Revelation, he reveals this to us again by saying this, and this is, I, when I read this verse this week, it just hit different. The power of this verse and these words, just really focus in on what it's saying. Revelation 1, verse 17 and 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. 
John is having this revelation of Jesus. And when he sees Jesus in heaven, he falls at his feet as though dead. But then Jesus assures him, no, I am the first and the last. Jesus is the living one who died but is alive forevermore, conquering death and getting the keys to show all authority and power alive forever. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead and he ascended into heaven. Jesus descended to conquer death and destroy sin. But Jesus ascended to give us this confidence in that. That he conquers sin and death and that we can have confidence in our forgiveness that he is God. Have you ever, even for a moment, doubted if you could really be forgiven? Jesus' ascension into heaven gives us the confidence that we can be forgiven. His dissension said, I'm destroying death. His ascension is, I conquered death, and I'm now forgiving you, and it's proven. This is what the creed points to. That you can have confidence and forgiveness today by putting faith and trust in Jesus, the living one. It is finished. That is what we are pointing to today. The finished work on the cross and that your sin, my sin, was paid for and forgiven. This is the good news, right? This is the whole true gospel. Think, if this was our focus... Think, if this was our focus, this gives us the concept of victory that we have in Jesus. He became sin who knew no sin that we could become his righteousness. So what would it look like if we held on to this, held on to the truth of the gospel, and went into a dying world telling them of a risen, alive Savior, that our God is alive and seated on the throne? Through any situation, we can be bold and confident in our God. And when we struggle with sin, and we, when we wrestle with doubt and hesitation, we can be confident that Jesus overcame sin and death, and he is alive. And he proves this by being with the Father. We can be a church totally devoted to Jesus and not wavering to popper, popular ideologies, but knowing confidently that we are loved and forgiven. So when we pray, it's not talking to thin air. When we pray, it's not just talking to the ceiling. It's not just talking to ourselves. When we pray, we are talking to a real risen Savior, Savior, and you are never alone, and our God sits on the throne alive and well. We can put our true hope in Him. So today, if you know this, may you marvel in the wonder at how amazing Jesus truly is, fully human, and fully God. Or if this is your first time even understanding this, or getting a grasp of what the gospel is, will you put your hope in him and believe that God sent his one and only son that if you believe in him, you will not die, but have eternal life? Will you pray with me? Jesus, right now, You are seated on a throne in heaven. And right now, Jesus, you hear our prayer. Right now, you are alive. You conquered death and sin. And you offered us forgiveness. Right now, Jesus, you're with us. You know us. You love us. Help us to truly understand who you are. That if we believe in you, maybe hold on to this assurance of our faith that we have been forgiven. And if we are just coming to this knowledge, Jesus, we thank you that when you died, you didn't stay dead, but you rose again, proving that you truly are the Son of God. And that if I put my hope and faith and trust in you, I can be forgiven. There is nothing greater than this. Thank you for being our good news. We give our life and devotion to you, God. May we walk in your truth today.
It's in your holy and matchless risen name we pray. Amen. See you later, Crossbridge. We're so glad you joined us today. We believe that steps of faith happen in community, and we would love for you to connect and grow with us in a small group at Crossbridge. Our chat hosts are dropping a link in the chat now so you can see all the virtual and in-person groups we have available. If you have questions or are not sure what group is best for you, shoot us a message at prayer at crossbridgecc.org. We can't wait to help you connect. We are all about loving God, loving people, and serving the world. If you want to give to help further that mission, you can head over to crossbridgecc.org give for all the ways you can contribute.